All right, well, there is uh, another challenge that we all have uh, and collectively face uh, on the internet and with the technology that impacts uh, our daily lives. And there's a ton of hard working people uh, working on it, and, and that is uh, the matter of cybersecurity. Uh, you know, I think many of you in this room, if not most of you in this room last year were affected by the Log4J vulnerability. Uh, you know, people I talk to in cybersecurity groups uh, and in enterprise uh, technology continue to work on remediating uh, this vulnerability that was so widespread and, uh, you know, really uh, compromised the systems of, of so many different systems. Uh, at that time, uh, there was a call for collective action to work on uh, open source uh, security, to improve the global software supply chain in order to make it safer, secure, to in many ways sort of get ahead uh, of this big problem that we all collectively face and, and puts a lot of us at risk if you know a hospital is subject to a cyber hacking attempt uh, through a open source vulnerability or if critical services get shut down. One of the people who really answered the call almost immediately to uh, go all in and help solve this problem was, uh, is our next speaker, uh, Eric Brewer. Uh, Eric is the Vice President of Infrastructure and a Fellow at uh, Google. Uh, he's also uh, a board member for our Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, he has a long history of being one of the builders of the uh, internet. He is uh, known for formulating the CAP theorem on distributed network applications in the late 90s. Today, Eric's going to talk about, to us about how we can collectively improve open source supply chain security. Please welcome Eric Brewer. Ah, we managed to hide the clicker. <laughs> That's all right, who needs slides? I'm happy to be here. Uh, I spoke to many of you in Austin on a topic of curation, and this is kind of a follow-on to that talk about automation. Uh, you may not remember what curation is. I hear a thing coming. There we go, all right. So curation answers the problem of open source is as is. <laughs> it comes as is, it says as is. Uh, and at the same time, it's used in important infrastructure worldwide. Almost all nations depend on it. 90% of enterprises use open source. So wildly successful, except with that success comes kind of top-down mandates, like, oh, you have to be secure, you have to have supply chain security, you have to have S-bombs. And more and more of these regulations are coming from many different countries. Uh, and top-down regulations don't actually work very well with as-is software, which with, by definition, it's on the consumer to figure out how to make those things happen. So curation is this thing in the middle which says the curator, which could be a maintainer or a company, you know, Red Hat's a classic example of a curator, they provide security patches to their customers, so they are curating the open source so that it's not as is, it actually comes with some guarantees about security and support. So we need a layer of curation, broadly speaking, and uh, that's not gonna go away, but it, you just dig into that, well, how do we get there? And the, one of the important parts is automation. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the good news is because all these governments and companies have realized they have to solve this problem, I am seeing an increase in funding you know, in various ways. It's not like it's immediately here and economic downturn doesn't help with all this. But bottom line is I've met with you know, the US government, UK, Germany, and several others. And they're all like, we depend on open source. It's a problem. How can we help? So they don't know how to help yet. And we'll work with them on that. But you know, you can just see that there's interest in getting, you know, getting this solved. They're willing to pay for curation. They want to buy open source in some way that's supported. Uh, they would, I think, even pay maintainers if they knew how to do that. It's not easy to pay maintainers because there's so many of them and they have all different locations and countries, but it's, it is coming. So that's the good news. Um, but we still need automation because you, it's, it's really hard to get all this stuff to just work the right way. <laughs> And in particular, when you look at supply chain security, it's not like it's about fixing one bug, it's about fixing a bug in a dependency, fixing all the dependency chains up to the things that you care about, 
rebuilding all those intermediate artifacts, signing them with provenance so that you can prove what's in them, and eventually getting a package or a container that you can use. Right? And most of those steps right now are manual. If someone fixed log4j, someone else has to fix the thing above it, and fix the thing above that, and fix the thing above that. Right? And there's, by the way, millions of Java packages that indirectly use log4j, and all of them had to be fixed roughly manually. Right? Very little automation in that process. And you know, many people have stepped up and done that, but that is a heavy toll. So I kind of feel like automation is the only path to get to a secure supply chain where consumers can understand what they got and how it was built without saying maintainers do more, right? That's not my message. My, my message is let's get automation working so maintainers do less and we can deliver more uh, in an automated way. So it starts out with something simple, which is even the way you build something today tends to be manual. And I don't mean that you haven't figured out how to build your stuff in an automated way on your laptop. What I mean is consumers of your packages can't build it in an automated way, right? What does it take to build? Well, you go to the readme file and you figure out what to install and you, maybe you make a VM image and then you install some stuff and it doesn't work the first several times and eventually you get to the point that you can actually build the thing, but that's a lot of toil. Right. If you're already a maintainer, it's no big deal because you've already done that once. But if you want to build someone else's package quickly because it has a vulnerability and you depend on it, it is not so easy. Right? And it might be by the way in a language you don't know. That happens too. Right? So really I'd like to see us get to the point where any curator or consumer of a package or a jar file can actually know how to build it from source. You know, and if we were taking a step farther, I don't want a README file. I want something that's much more automated. The best case would be, here's a build system that knows how to build it, and you can invoke it, right? And whatever needs to be installed in the VM to build that thing is already there because someone else set it up, right? If we can't get there, we can maybe get something which is more descriptive. Here's a YAML file that says how to build things, but it's, you know, it's not for humans to read. It's for machines to read, right? That would be a step up. And by the way, I want... Uh, consumers and curators to pay for this build, right? Who pays for the builds now? Is it on the maintainers to do builds and testing, cover the OPEX for that? That doesn't seem fair, right? So I'll couple, talk, give some examples of this, but really a, a side effect of this is two things. We would actually have the ability for someone else to pay for builds that cares, including governments. We'd also start getting things like assigned output, like was it really built the right way or not? We don't really know that today. Right. You can build it yourself and then you know, but that's, a, that's again, high toil. So what does this mean? I really would like users to first know that the version they're running is the, actually the version you intend them to run, meaning what was built with the correct dependencies and reasonable tool chain, things like that. Um, automatic builds are a huge, would be a huge improvement, but also it's, you know, the obvious next step is reproducible builds, right? Some groups like Debian have, have done a good job with this. But like, suppose Google does the build for you, then you decide, do you trust Google's build process? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If it's reproducible, someone else can build it and check it, right? And that gives us a level of transparency that would be great. So that's a harder, it's much harder to get to reproducible builds, but that should be the goal. And because we're in an environment where the provenance matters and things like S-bombs are coming, again, I don't really want maintainers worried about S-bomb generation. I want you to use a build system that generates S-bombs as a side effect of having an automated build, right? And by the way, the S-bomb standards will change, there'll be other standards coming or other regulations. I don't want you worried about those either. I want those built into the build system and magically taken care of, right? And done well, I, my hope is that being a maintainer will be less work because you get more from your infrastructure and how it's built, how it's signed, where it's stored, how it's distributed, how your users know which is the right one. So signs that we'd be on the right track would be things like someone that wants to use a package and, and curate it for their use case, make sure it's secure, can actually build and test it themselves easily without having to know that much about the project. Again. Most teams are using thousands of packages. They can't possibly understand them all in detail. It'd be really nice if I sent you a pull request that I could actually prove that it passed your tests. If I had automated builds and tests, I could actually get them signed and you'd say, oh, I'll take this pull request a bit more seriously because I know it already passes my tests. Right? That's a little bit less work on me. 
right? And there are systems I've seen, uh, Grafeus has this working with Circle CI, I believe. Uh, so it's not like this is totally novel, but I think it's something we'd want to move towards. And again, letting others run their own tests at their own expense, uh, absolutely reasonable. I, I would make, the, I can't really make a promise, but I would say as a blanket statement, Google would be happy to run tests on critical open source packages. We're probably dependent on them anyway, directly or indirectly, right? We, we pay a huge amount on fuzz testing, which I'll get to in a second. So, you know, many groups should be willing to pay to do extensive testing on these kinds of critical packages at least. Not all packages, but certainly the ones that are critical to society. Now, uh, we do this already in a narrow case that's worth covering a little bit, which is OSS Fuzz. Um, this is a fuzzing service that fuzzes open source packages, about a thousand plus critical open source packages today. This is paid for by Google, and actually it's quite expensive because fuzz testing is expensive. And so far it's fixed about 29,000 bugs, of which, you know, from 10, roughly uh, almost 10,000 vulnerabilities. So what's interesting about this is it is doing automatic builds and tests for the narrow case of fuzz testing. So when you have your package integrated here, which is not that hard, what you're telling us is how to build your package and how to run tests on it so that we can, again, automatically run tests even as you do updates. And once you have this automated testing, a huge bunch of things come out of it. The most interesting one is, in my mind at least, is bisection testing. So bisection testing is fuzzing found a bug which pull request introduced that bug and how do you find it? And the answer is you do binary search. So you just say it's between this point and this point, I'll see in the middle and I'll see if the bug's there and I can refine down to the exact pull request that introduced the thing. And of course, if you introduce a fix, I'll know the request that fixed it, right? So the reason that it has a high bug fix rate is when OSS Fuzz tells you we found a bug in your critical open source package, we tell you which pull request introduced it, right? It's very specific. So the fix rate on those bug reports are 90%, right? Way, way higher than normal bug report requests. Now part of this, these are critical packages and the communities are responsive as well. But this is a working example of automated testing and building, making maintainers' lives easier by giving them high quality bug reports tied to CLs or pull requests that are you know, relatively easy to fix because of that precision. But I don't wanna do this just for fuzz testing. I wanna do it for all kinds of testing and builds. And also, I don't really wanna do it just for a thousand packages. Now, even Google can't pay to do all the builds and tests for all the millions of packages. Not realistic. But I do think we can enable a framework that would make it easier to do automated builds and tests and then as groups that care about curation and SBOMs and FedRAMP and all the regulations coming, that platform will enable them to pay for tests and to participate in a way that they can't participate today. So this is not an easy path. In fact, I'm not even telling you today, here's a build service you can use, although I hope many such build services will exist in the future. But I wanted to get it out there that this is the path we need to be on uh, and this is really the only way to get security to be pervasive, right? We, we can't have so much manual toil in so many packages that we depend on, right? It's not sustainable and it's not fun, frankly. Let's take all the unfun stuff out of development and put those into automated services as the best we can and go back to the fun stuff. That would be great. So, What's this automation train? Well, automated builds is the easiest. In fact, if you look at the sorts of specifications, what it means to ha have a secure supply chain, having a, a trusted build service is kind of a core part of that. I, I really don't want critical packages built on somebody's laptop running unknown software, right? I'd really like it to be in a repeatable system, ideally reproducible, running on a build service that produces signed outputs, right? That's, that's good development, right? We need that broadly speaking. Testing is not just fuzzing. I think we have lots of things we can apply in this space. Uh, scorecards, which Tracy mentioned in the earlier talk, is a fantastic thing. It's just really about the hygiene of your uh, packages in, man in the repositories, uh, and it covers a wide number of things. OSV Scanner and also other groups like, like Sneak, for example, do a great job of helping find vulnerabilities, but we actually need to automate those things as well. 
Uh, Go's done a good job with vulnerability check. You can actually for Go, it'll tell you what are the vulnerabilities in all the packages that you're using. It's very easy to use. You should go check that out if you're a Go user. And finally, let's be able to, when you're doing automated tests, let's prove that the tests pass because that, again, allows maintainers to not have to run those tests themselves, right? That's a, another way to reduce toil. And then finally, when you have built a correct and tested package, it'd be nice to actually automatically publish it as well. So we work with the Python Foundation, PyPy, to do trusted publishing, right? Let's make that a bit more integrated into that process, right? And that can, again, apply to a wide variety of languages. So uh, this is kind of the beginning of this. I'm certainly not the first person to call for automation or reproducible builds, but I think what's different here is saying that this is, we need to do it as kind of a framework that everyone can participate in uh, that focuses on you know, enabling players like governments that have money to participate at least in the OPEX, if not in even more direct payment of people, which I think is on the table too. So hopefully we want this change. Uh, hopefully what it means is how do you do a build? Like we don't, we don't have a spec in general for how to do a build, right? Readme file can't be the answer for how you do a build. It's gotta be something that a computer can read. Um, how to run tests, how to prove a test is complete. Those are things that I think we've, there's lots of tools that can help with parts of that, but we don't have a kind of a generalized way to do it. So last thing I wanna talk about, uh, hopefully you saw the little, uh, Titan keys on your chairs. Those are a gift to encourage um, two-factor authentication. <laughs> and all developers, especially in critical packages, should be using two-factor authentication to sign their changes. But it's also ISRG's 10th anniversary. I just wanted to call out uh, a success story here for Let's Encrypt. 300 million certificates generated. You, you use these all the time. It means that the web is mostly HTTPS now instead of the un insecure version. Uh, so Let's Encrypt has been a huge success and I wanna congratulate them for that. We've also worked with them on Rust in the Linux kernel to try to make that a big deal. So let me just uh, stop with that and say thank you to them and congratulations on 10 great years. Thank you so much. <laughs>